Good morning. Unity. Like was what was just read, how pleasant unity is and how good it is. <clears throat> what does unity mean to you? <clears throat> Have you ever been part of a uh, sports team that has been unified? Uh, what, what's the, the end goal? What is that team unified for? It's for victory, right? It's for winning a game. Uh, what about a business that you're a part of. When a business is in unity, they are working towards uh, meeting a goal, um, whether it be you know sales that month, quarterly revenue goal. You see, a business can have unity. What about a family? Family can be unified in uh, having a Bible study together once a week or having a, a goal uh, for the family, for the children, for the mother, and for the father. So we see unity all around us. Anytime there's a group of people that, um, that come together, whether it be a sports team, a, a business, a family, or a church like us, there has to be unity. That's, that's the goal. Because when a team or a group of people are in unity, we see the common goal. People are like-minded. People understand that they have to be selfless in order to get everyone to get to that en end goal. Everyone's on the same page. And how good it is when people are in unity. Because have you ever been part of a, a group that has not been in unity? <coughs> it's not enjoyable at all. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be a part of it. But how good it is. We'll be spending most of our time this morning in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. So if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, be reading the, the first half of that chapter. So as we see what, I, what I've previous, previously spoken of, uh, unity in, in a group of people. God calls us as Christians, as a body of Christ, to be unified. And we see that in Ephesians chapter 4. So we'll be reading through the first half of Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to call to your attention uh, four points, uh, four aspects of unity that we can learn from and apply to our lives and apply to this church here at Kaysville. So starting in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. <clears throat> so if, if you're like me, your, your Bible, at the, the heading of chapter 4, it says unity in the body of Christ. So we know that Ephesians 4 is talking about unity, right? The first point that I want to bring to your attention is what should our mindset be? What should our mindset be in order to achieve unity in the body of Christ, which is what we are today. I think we can all agree that building unity, it's, it's a process, right? Uh, members of a body, members of a group are at different stages in their maturity. And there's always room for improving our unity. I don't think you can ever get to a point where you are in perfect unity. We can strive for that, right? And I think in the end, when we are with Christ, that's when we achieve the, the perfect and true unity. But we can always get better. And how we treat each other has an enormous impact on how we build unity. 
how can a how can a group of people build unity when they are impatient with one another, when they are not gentle, when they don't extend mercy, when you don't have an environment like that, um, no one is comfortable, no one is comfortable uh, reaching out. And I love the song that Jeff led, um, and having unity with each other, um, having a, a common a common bond. <coughs> Uh, rejoicing with one another, uh, mourning with each other. Um, when there's no environment, when the mindset is not there to be unified of, of grace and of love, there can be no unity. Because we make mistakes when we grow. And people, we need to be patient and we need to be understanding with one another. If we go to Philippians chapter 2, <coughs> This is a, another, uh, another passage on, on unity. But if we uh, jump over to Philippians chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So we see here the, the mindset, the key to that unity is being selfless, being honest with one another, and having humility. That means being willing to be open-minded when, when someone thinks about something differently than you. And you don't necessarily ag agree um, with that. Um, because, you know what, sometimes we may be wrong on something that we think or that we've grown up knowing, and uh, we can change the way we view something just from being honest with ourselves and showing humility. And I love how uh, Paul says here, we should look to the interests of others. I've always found, uh, like in, in a business, in a, in a work environment, how is it when people are only looking out for themselves? Have you ever been a part of, of that before? Um, you can never trust anyone. Because you know if, if you tell someone what you're really thinking, what are they going to do? <laughs> They're going to go behind your back and, and say, hey, you know what Jordan's talking about? You know? Um, that's that's uh, something that we have to, to realize is that we should look to the interests of others. Uh, foregoing that, that ball game that we were planning on going to or that movie that we wanted to go see and instead go visit someone. Go bring someone a meal. So that is our mindset in unity, what it takes to, to be unified. If we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, and let's go to verse 13. I'm having trouble with this microphone here. So in Ephesians chapter 4, let's go to verse 3 now. <clears throat> eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So my next question for you is what are we to be unified by? Um, we, see, we see all groups of people, um, they are unified by something, right? We look at the Pharisees uh, who were unified in killing Jesus, right? They were all on the same page in wanting to crucify Jesus. You look at churches here in America in the 1800s and, and 1900s that were unified in refusing black members' membership to worship with them. These folks, they were unified, right? But what they were unified by is what the issue is. Because these folks, they were unified by a, a common hatred for another person or another group of people. We see here in Ephesians chapter 4 that we are unified by who? We're unified by the Holy Spirit. It says it right here. 
uh, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I see this to mean that the Holy Spirit is the giver of unity. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that in one spirit we were baptized into the body, and we were made to drink of one spirit. We as followers of Christ, uh, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and the Holy Spirit is working through us. And when we have that common source and that common foundation, we cannot help but be unified. <clears throat> and also, something else I wanted to, to show you is you'll notice that this unity of the Holy Spirit, it's in the bond of peace. I think that's really important to, to notice here. Um, because from what the song that Jeff just led, there's peace and there's safety when you are unified. You feel comfortable with one another. Uh, you can be open with each other. And, there, and there's encouragement. There's love and there's patience. And that's why you can have that unity. So continuing on, in Ephesians chapter 4, and this is kind of where I want to spend <clears throat> a lot of the time this morning. So the, the next point to unity, the next question I want to pose to you <clears throat> is what are we to be unified in? We've talked about the mindset of unity. We've talked about what we are unified by. We're unified by the Holy Spirit. But now what are we to be unified in as a body of Christ, as a church? So if we look in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. <clears throat> there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs uh, to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of of Christ's gift. And Paul continues in, in the spiritual gifts that were given to the apostles to build up the church, right? To build up the church. And if we look, if we uh, look at verse 13 now, if we continue to verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 4, it says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what are we to be unified in? I think we see right here that we are to be unified in the truth. We're to be unified in the truth. In my, uh, in my Bible here, I have uh, <clears throat> off to the side, I have the seven ones. The seven ones. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father. And this is truth. Truth is, uh, it's, it's not subjective. There's no changing truth. It, truth is truth. It's there. It's objective. And we see here, there's one church. There's one body because there's only one head, right? And who is that head? The head is Christ. The head is Christ our Lord. There's one hope. Because there's only one spirit that can dwell in us and transform our lives so that we can have a relationship with God. There's one faith. Because there's only one God and Father who can make eternity with him happen. And there's only one baptism. Because it's our only way into Christ, through Christ, towards reconciliation, and it's Christ's plan for our salvation. These truths are absolute. There's no getting around them, and there's no changing them. And we as a church, we should, be, we should be unified in that. There should be unity in how we think about these truths. And I think based off of these truths, we can build off, right? We can, we can build off of these truths into, an, into other aspects of, of how we behave, of how we treat others, of how we worship God. In Romans 15, <clears throat> Paul calls us to live in harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus. He also says in Philippians chapter 2 that the church should be of the same mind, 
having the same love and being in full accord and of one mind. Now, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Does being unified and of the same mind meaning thinking the exact same thing on every single issue, in every single topic? Um, I think we should use our discernment <clears throat> and our wisdom in knowing what truth is versus what opinion is. Um, and I think a lot of times, and this is just from the culture that we live in and how, and how we grew up, I think we're in danger sometimes of seeing unity as an environment where there is no conflict, where there's no differing viewpoints, and when there's no differing perspectives, because it's comfortable for us. It's comfortable for us to be in our own little bubble and, uh, and not be challenged. I think we can think that's what unity is sometimes. But one thing I, I want to, to talk about is, is conflict. <clears throat> conflict is not a negative thing. Conflict is it's a neutral thing, right? I think how we choose to react to conflict makes it good or makes it bad. Because we're a body of Christ. We're human beings. And um, there's going to be conflict. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. We come from different life experiences. We come from different perspectives. We have different viewpoints. And I think we should embrace the differences that we have in order to become more unified. And I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying that uh, we should change the truth, right? I've already said that truth is absolute. I'm saying these are in matters of opinion and what we feel comfortable with or not comfortable with. <clears throat> One of my really good friends, uh, he told me this past week that unity is not conformity. Unity is not conformity. Because how should we expect to grow <coughs> if we are not challenged to think differently and ask the hard questions? It's only when we ask these hard questions and really wrestle with the answers and not be uh, spiritually lazy that we can be even more unified. Because when we ask those hard questions and we wrestle with the answers, our, our faith, it becomes stronger, right? And when our faith becomes stronger and our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ becomes stronger, we have that unity that God calls us to have. And finally, what are we to be unified for? What, uh, what is our end goal? So if we continue in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13 now, we'll read verse 13 again. <clears throat> Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So, what is our end goal here? I want to talk about a, just a, a few points about what our end goal is in being unified and having unity in the body of Christ. So I think we see here in Ephesians chapter 4 that one end goal of unity is to be mature and to be established. Only a unified group of people can withstand adversity. We see here in Ephesians 4, it talks about um, we shouldn't be children. We shouldn't be tossed around by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Um, there's going to be adversity that comes, especially, uh, especially to a group that things are happening that are good, things are going well, uh, Satan is going to attack. Satan is going to throw adversity um, in the way of, of a church. So there has to be communication. 
uh, with a group when difficult times come. Because everyone is in this together. If there is no unity, if there's no communication, if everyone is just out there on their own for themselves, we know that doesn't end well, right? You look at any, uh, any battle scene in a movie, and uh, what happens when you have a couple people that start retreating from, from a battle? Everyone starts retreating. It's every man for themselves, and they get slaughtered. And it's the same thing for a body, same thing for a body of Christ. When there's no unity, um, it's frightening how quickly a body can break apart, can fall apart. A second thing I want to talk about in, in the goal for unity is that we should imitate Christ. We should imitate Christ so that we can grow up into him to be a healthy body um, because that's what we are. That's what we are as, as fellow followers of Christ. Um, some people, they can encourage. Some people can teach. Some can preach. Uh, we have those that have uh, zeal for the lost in the community, and they're really good at, at going and, and reaching out to those that are in the community. Um, we have people who have resources to help the less fortunate, whether it be money, whether it be time. Uh, we have those that are really good at comforting others that are grieving. And we have those that are really good at being merciful, at extending mercy. So we see this body, it has all these different functions. Um, but we all work in harmony because we all have that end goal and that single purpose. And what is that single purpose? That single purpose is, number one, it's spreading the gospel. Um, because like I said earlier, when you are part of a group of people that is not unified, is it enjoyable to be around? No, it's not. But when people see a, a group that is unified, they want to be a part of it because it's, um, it's exciting. People are in sync. It's transformational. And that's how the body of Christ should be uh, when we are unified. And finally, we are to be unified so that we bring God all the glory. I think that's the end goal of unity. So let's go to Romans chapter 15. I think Romans chapter 15, uh, Paul says it really good right here. He says it better than I ever could. So in Romans chapter 15, Starting in verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when a church, when a body of Christ has unity, they understand what they are striving for. They understand that what they are striving for is so much bigger than themselves. Um, what they are striving for is to glorify God. There's no selfishness. Uh, there's no looking out for number one. It's all about putting everyone's needs before yours because it gets you closer to that final goal. We as Christians uh, are not in the body for ourselves, right? We, we're in it to help each other, to encourage one another, to rejoice with each other, uh, to, to mourn with one another, to extend mercy, um, and to have love. We're not in it to have the biggest church. We're not in it to have the largest membership or the nicest building. We're in it. We are unified so that God may receive all the glory. Um, all the glory and the honor and the praise is due him uh, because he is the creator of all things. So in summary, with unity, we talked about our mindset for unity. And what's that mindset? It's humility. It's patience. It's gentleness. It's love. It's looking out for your brother or your sister. We talked about 
who we are to be unified by. <clears throat> we are unified by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, it's the giver of unity. We talked about truth, right? Truth is, it's absolute. There's no changing it. And we should be unified in our, uh, in our belief of that truth. And finally, unity in spreading the gospel and unity in doing it for God's glory. Um, because again, God, he created everything um, and he deserves all the glory and the praise that we can give to him. So that was a, a short little talk on, on unity and what it means for, for us as Christians, us as followers of Christ. And um, it wasn't about being a Christian. It wasn't about how to become a Christian. Uh, but I, I want to extend an invitation for, for anyone, uh, anyone here who, who hasn't started that walk to be unified with Christ or to be unified uh, with fellow Christians, um, we, can, we can do that for you here this morning. Uh, we can baptize you, and you can receive that Holy Spirit, and that's the foundation for being unified. Also, I just want to extend an invitation for, um, for someone who may be discouraged, um, who may be struggling with something in their lives that they, they just want to get off their, uh, they just want to get off their chest. Um, if, if we can help you in a public manner by praying for you, um, we can do that for you. So if there's anything that you need, let's uh, come forward as we stand and sing.